Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, seminar series of the Center for Cybersecurity Research and Innovation. Um, today, um, we have with us uh, Dr. Thuan Pak from University of Dallas, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, security testing with FASI. Um So before introducing um, Dr. Thuan Pak, um, I'm going to acknowledge, make an acknowledgement of country. Um, I don't know if we should, it, is it already recording? Okay, good. Um, we acknowledge the people of uh, the Wangurang and Wangura language group of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct the visits of RMIT University and the lands that I'm speaking from today. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the First Nation people of the five Kulin Nations, their ancestors and elders, past, present, and emerging. RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and uh, waters across Australia where we conduct our, work, our business. Um, the RMIT University uh, Center for Cybersecurity Research Innovation, uh, abbreviated CCSR, is a multidisciplinary research center that brings researchers from different um, areas across RMIT to bring a truly multidisciplinary approach to the organizational human and technology aspect of cybersecurity. Um, there's one thing that uh, Amy just um, want uh, all of us to know is uh, we have a new uh, HDR cyber club. Uh, and um, if you, uh, you're welcome to join the club uh, and you can send uh, an email to ccsri at rmit.edu.au uh, to join or inquire. Um, so now let me introduce um, the speaker of today. Um, Dr. Thuan Pham is an ARC DECRA fellow and lecturer in cybersecurity. Um, somehow it keeps jumping. Um, at the University of Melbourne, he received his PhD degree in computer science from uh, the National University of Singapore in 2017. Um, he has been working on scalable and high performance fast testing to improve the reliability and security of software systems. Uh, and his research in collaboration with companies and government agencies has led to many papers published at premier value venues. Um, one US patent, one Australian provisional patent. He has developed several open source tools for automated security testing um, that are responsible for more than 100 critical vulnerabilities discovered in large real world software systems. His research has been featured on media channels like um, the register.co.uk and securityweek.com. So without fur any further ado, let us welcome uh, Dr. Todd. Uh, I just want to test the uh, Thanks, Juan, for a very nice uh, introduction. And thanks, everyone, for inviting me to uh, present my work uh, today. Uh, so, uh, I'm Tuan from the uh, University of Melbourne, and today I'm going to present uh, the work on uh, effective uh, security testing and fuzzing, and I share some open challenges and uh, some solutions that we have been working on, and also some limitations as well, and open uh, opportunity for collaboration. Uh, so, first, uh, let me acknowledge uh, all the um, collaborators that I uh, have uh, been working with uh, in uh, the past few years to complete the work that I'm presenting today and uh, the sponsor for my work, for sure, the Justice Melbourne. I also get funding from Google and funding from ASC, so really uh, helpful uh, for me to conduct my research. Uh, first, uh, because like uh, the topic is about fuzzing and I believe uh, it's still pretty new terminology for many of you, so I will spend the first part of the talk today to quickly introduce the concept. And in the second part, I will share the open challenges and some solutions that we have been working on. And uh, the last part, uh, I hope we have uh, a lot of time for Q&A. So first, uh, what is fuzzing? So uh, fuzzing actually is the terminology that uh, was uh, invented by Professor Button Miller uh, from the Institute we could see in the US in around two, um, 1989. It's a pretty long uh, time ago. Uh, but uh, it's become uh, very uh, popular and very uh, effective now. It has been used by many companies. They use the approach uh, to test their software system every day, uh, 24 hours, um, like uh, to detect uh, vulnerabilities 
And at a very high level point of view, uh, fuzzing basically is the process of repeatedly select huge number of input uh, and send them to the system under test to check for any kind of like abnormal behavior. How to define abnormal behavior? It depends on the problem, right? For example, uh, here we have the uh, father on the left. I just take some sample input and this uh, mutate or we perturb them to generate a million of new input we send to the system and that's we check if something went wrong. And uh, if there is something went wrong, we keep the input and share the input with the user uh, for, uh, all, I mean, the developer for fixing. Suppose that I'm testing the PowerPoint, the app that I'm presenting now, right? Uh, I will take some sample input in the form of the PPTX file, and we will take that, we modify it a bit, for example, remove some image, add some image, remove some script or whatever inside that input in order to uh, explore as many uh, possible behaviors of the system and the test as possible. So depending on the type of the um, approach, we might have three main uh, fuzzing approaches. First, black box, second, gray box, and third one is the white box, depending on how much information the technique knows about the system and the test. If the technique know nothing about the system and the test, we consider it's the black box approach. It does know about the input and output of the system. If we know everything about the system and the test, like the source code or whatever, right? We have the white box one, and we have the gray box one, which is something in between, which know a little bit about the system and the test, and it makes it much more practical. And it's the reason why gray box fuzzing is considered like the best approach now, the most popular approach now, and it's the main focus of my talk today, but if you would like to discuss about other approaches, I'm open because I'm working on other approaches as well. Um, so, um, because uh, fuzzing show great, uh, uh, like, result, achieve the great result, uh, people in the industry and also in the uh, academic uh, try to um, sit together to think about what is the open challenge uh, for fuzzing. So, in 2019, uh, many researchers from both uh, uh, academic and also um, industry like Google, Facebook, we um, have like four day meeting in Sunan in Tokyo and we discussed about several open challenges for uh, fuzzing. I would like to list uh, four main challenges that I uh, mainly focus on. Uh, first, uh, we want to do the testing of fuzzing for more type of software system because as I said, uh, depend on the type of system we might have different definition of what is the input, what is the structure of the input, and what is considered like abnormal behavior, right? And the second one, we want to find more bugs or more vulnerabilities uh, and uh, more difficult one, something that uh, high very deep inside the logic of the system and the test. And uh, we also want to detect uh, more type of work as well. For example, in the past, mainly we focus on something like buffer overflow, stack overflow. Uh, how about detecting something else? like SQL injection or um, like um, uh, comma injection and so on. How to detect uh, this kind of properties. And lastly, uh, how to put human in the loop. We are trying to talk uh, about fuzzing as an automated approach, but from my point of view, and also uh, I share a lot of my like, common issues with other uh, How do we like leverage the human domain knowledge? Because as an uh, automated approach, we run them for long. But at some point in time, they get stuck. And instead of like waiting for another few more days, why don't we interact with the tool to give them some guidance, right? And taking our guidance, they might be able to make it progress, something like that. So this is the four main challenges that uh, we discussed, and so this is uh, the uh, main topic of my research that I'm presenting today. And uh, interestingly, just uh, two months ago, we had similar uh, meeting, but in uh, Germany, uh, to talk about a uh, similar topic and basically a lot of us try to reflect what we have done in the past uh, four years uh, regarding those challenges. We met uh, quite a lot of progress, but uh, there's still quite many challenges. So first, let me talk about the first type of challenge that uh, I'm interested in is to how to test more software system and second, how to find uh, more difficult bugs. And one specific uh, example of this is network protocol that uh, satisfies both of these two uh, categories. 
uh, why the good protocol is uh, important uh, and what is our solution. Let me uh, talk about this in a minute. This is uh, a paper that uh, we published um, three years ago. The question, why should we care about network protocols? Because everything that we are using today, we follow some kind of protocol. For example, even the protocol between this one, the uh, pointer here, and uh, this one through the Bluetooth is protocol, right? Or even like uh, when we send email from uh, the sender to the receiver, we follow some protocol as well. So uh, all of this protocol enable us to conduct uh, our work, to conduct our study, and so on. So the protocol is very critical. But fuzzing or testing the protocol itself is very challenging. Why? Compared to other approaches, for example, compared to uh, testing the PowerPoint, we just send uh, this uh, PowerPoint file and we uh, try to test. But the specific characteristic of protocol is something we call like stateful property. What does this mean? Server accepts a sequence of messages. And the behavior of the server depends on the current message and also depends on the current state of the server. And the current state of the server is controlled by the previous message that the server accepted and processed before. Right? So in order to test such kind of system, we need to somehow automatically generate a sequence of messages, not only a single message or single file like the case that we test the PowerPoint. Right? Let's give a very concrete example here. We have the uh, communication between the FTP client and the FTP server uh, to uh, store some file into the file server. So uh, the message from the server is uh, in black and the message from the uh, client is uh, in red here. And we can see that they follow some protocol. Every time server uh, send some uh, information to the client to tell the client about what is the current uh, state of the server, you can see like 220 FTP server ready, it means that server tell the client that I'm ready for you to uh, send any kind of message. And similarly, after that, the client uh, need to know what is the current state of the server and send the request accordingly. If the client sends some request out of order or send some request when the server is not ready, the request will be rejected. Right? So from the testing point of view, we want to explore all the corner cases and so we want to explore as deep as possible the logic of the server. We don't want to stop at the very beginning. Right? So this one is the process for us to upload a file to the FTP server. And you can see this follow uh, six or five steps. And in order to test this, we need to generate a sequence message, not a single message. This is the key point. And this is the reason why the message order is important. And also knowing the current state of the server is important, so we can send the lightly uh, correct message right? instead of by sending some incorrect messages. So the existing approach uh, are quite um, like uh, limited, and also they have many disadvantages. The most popular one, the first one, is something we call like stateful black box fuzzing. It means that it's just uh, communicate with the server, it send a sequence of messages, but it know nothing about the current state of the server. So it means that it might send a wrong sequence of messages and so on. When without any kind of feedback from the server to the uh, father, the father don't know how to optimize the process. And another approach is the stateless gray box fuzzing uh, like APL. It means that it has the feedback to optimize the process, but it has no idea of what is the current state of the server, and it has no idea of the concept of sequence message. It just send one big chunk of data all at once, so the server might drop something in between because they doesn't follow like the format and whatever. And in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's some feature or the limitation was. Uh, aware of the whole developer community for the APL tool, one of the most famous um, uh, fuzzing tool. They know that, like one of the um, developers said, that one of the things that struggle is the limitation of APL uh, in such a way that it only performs fuzzing with one input file, one single input. For many systems, such as Netscope protocol, it would be useful if fuzzing could be done in a sequence of input. Right? So they are aware of this. 
and uh, we know about the limited set, but also we was very uh, motivated by what the developer uh, are expecting about the system. So it's the reason why we be well good. And the idea is that we uh, build a tool called Evernet, and Evernet work like a client application, and we test the server. So the client will try to replay uh, the normal communication or the transaction between the client and the server. And um, it will start with some sample input, but in this case, the sample input is not a file like uh, PDF with the, uh, uh, or um, the PowerPoint file, but the sample input is sequence basis. And after that, we modify modify the input uh, sequence in order to separate better input. And we also, uh, in addition to the code carpet that we normally uh, collect, we also try to receive some information we call like the current state of the server. And using that information, we construct something we call like state machine, and we use the state machine to guide the exploration. So it's a closed loop. We try to select more and more things <coughs> in to infer the state machine, and we use the state machine itself to optimize the process, right? So it's help each other to improve the result overall. And uh, the in uh, this list of uh, components, I would like to spend uh, a few minutes to talk about uh, state machine uh, learning or state machine inferencing because this is the one of the core uh, contribution of the work. So why we decided to do this in a fully automated way? Because compared to another approach like uh, manual or static approach to infer the state machine, these approaches are time consuming. Normally, it requires the domain knowledge from the developer to drive the state machine manually. And uh, more importantly, the implementation of the protocol might not be exactly the same like the specification. For example, the specification of the FTP protocol, you can easily download from the internet, but you might end up like finding hundreds of implementation for the protocol, and they are slightly different. So the model that we have from the specification might not be the, the correct one. We need something that basically capture the behavior, the correct behavior of the system under test. Like in this one, you can see this uh, step machine, the red line one, the transition from this step to this step is basically something that captured by our tool. It was not documented at all in the specification. It means that the developer act new feature at new transition. And without the automatic uh, state inferencing uh, component, we might not be able to detect that. And in fact, by detecting that, we could uh, end up like generating the correct input to trigger a properties in uh, the next step in this state machine. Right? So without knowing that transition, we might not be able to uh, find that issue. And uh, try to explain everything in uh, that specific example, the same uh, conversation between the client and the server. We will start by uh, constructing something, uh, a state machine by uh, a directed graph, and each node in the graph stand uh, by uh, capture the current state of the server. And what is the current state of the server? It can be uh, captured in different ways, but in our approach, uh, we define the state of the server based on the response from the client from the server. For example, here the server responds something like 220. We consider that this is the current step. And we have this one. And this is the initial uh, sequence of messages. We can modify it a bit and gradually we can add more nodes and we add more transition to the step machine. So we have more complicated uh, and also like a more precise step machine. And we uh, make the decision to uh, focus more on the uh, steps that are more progressive in the sense that we can detect more interesting behavior of the system under test. When we have the step machine, right, we should not like spend uh, equal time to each step because some step is more interesting than other. So what is the algorithm? We decide to focus on something that is more progressive. So uh, go back to the previous example. Uh, we have uh, this one is the original message. And after doing some kind of like mutation, uh, instead of using the correct password, we change from the correct password to the wrong one. We can explore a new transition. And we have a new uh, step, we add to the step machine, and we have the transition. And so the input that helps us to trigger the new step. With all of this, 
we can explore more and eventually we have more state, more transition, more input, and hopefully it trigger some uh, bugs or vulnerabilities in the system. And we conduct uh, the, uh, some uh, experiment on uh, real world implementation of some protocol like the RTSP for real time uh, streaming protocol that uh, has been used by many services, including uh, YouTube and so on. And we detect some implementations uh, of that protocol that have uh, the um, boundaries, like the one that I explained before, due to the new transition here, and several other things. And uh, we got a very good uh, and encouraging comment from the community because they was waiting for this kind of tool for long. In the past, they used something for stateless system, not for the stateful system, uh, until the time that we introduced this one. And we make uh, the tool open source. And uh, now, until now, we have uh, 680 star and many folks in that people still work on this, still another project on top of this. and. We have uh, supported more than 10 different uh, protocols, including very popular one. And the red one here is all something that's uh, supported or um, like, uh, completed by the community. Uh, we just prepare the first few ones and we prepare very careful, uh, carefully designed tutorials so people add more. And uh, people also, interestingly, use our tool to test the 5G protocol, network protocol, and they find something. They did not tell us, but they, they, they found something in, in the report. And uh, to support the research community, we also create uh, a benchmark uh, and the automated system based on the Docker for uh, people to uh, build some approach on top of our approach or even like totally new approach. But they have the same setup, same environment for them to run the experiment, to compare and uh, like, uh, uh, find anything wrong or uh, any kind of improvement. And the upload is based on top of Docker, so it's kind of like uh, uh, click the start button and everything is run uh, and just like collect the data and analyze the data. So it's very uh, useful and in fact, um, it has been used by many uh, recent work that work on the topic of uh, and uh, in fact, like as I said, many people already try to come up with better idea to improve our tool, for example, to improve the uh, fuzzing speed, uh, to improve the state identification and so on. But uh, our tool was considered like the first approach, uh, robot approach that tackle this important problem. Uh, any questions so far before I move to the next one? It is clear to everyone. Any question from the online uh, audience? You can just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Yeah. Otherwise, let me move on and maybe we have the discussion at the end. So uh, that is the part that I talk about um, finding deeper part in uh, different type of software system, but right? in network protocol instead of like the normal standard system. And the second type of uh, topic that I would like to talk about today is uh, how do we detect more type of bugs? Right? So in the past, we talked about buffer overflow, stack overflow, like the one that I detected, but what about more type of bugs? And uh, I'm presenting uh, my student work uh, on uh, detecting excessive data exposure in web server response uh, with data morphing fuzzing. So basically from very high level view, Basically, we try to detect the data leakage over the web API. So the first question is why? Why should we care about excessive data exposure? I think I don't need to talk more about the incident with Optus, right? A lot of data uh, was leaked. I was one of the uh, victims as well, so yeah. But I use another example, and many of you may not know. The former Prime Minister of uh, Australia uh, got hacked after posting the public funds on Instagram. So uh, the story was that uh, around uh, September 2020, uh, the uh, former Prime Minister shared something about the public funds and uh, the hacker could uh, use the booking reference to get uh, a lot of information from uh, his account, including his passport in detail, passport number and whatever from the account. But how 
that I could, uh, that is what I um, try to explain today and uh, something that uh, the approach my student proposed can uh, handle. So what happened? Uh, the contest uh, website allowed the customer to check the status of the, their uh, body parts or their ticket. But the issue is that we can do that by providing just two simple information. First, the boarding, uh, the booking reference. And second, can you guess? Last name. Last Correct, name. last name. They just need the last name. So uh, the former Prime Minister shared a reference already, right? So the job is quite easy. And his uh, last name for sure, almost everyone knows. So the hacker can access uh, that website. And here is the snapshot of that website. And he tried to uh, explore around, but he could not find anything sensitive here, except like he can access the uh, fly information. But it's not like uh, personal information of the former Prime Minister. But what he did is that he tried to inspect the source code that behind the web page that you see here. This is something that the normal user see, right? But the hacker, they can see everything, or even uh, we as the developer, I think, and we as a web developer as well, can see uh, many things interesting by inspecting the code. And what he found is this one. Let a bird, uh, document number, expiry date, many things else. In the HTML source code, so it means that the information was filtered out by some JavaScript code, but in fact, the raw data is still there. So this is the problem of something we call like excessive data exposure. And it's very popular. It ranked uh, third in the top 10 critical parameters uh, web API based on the OSWAP uh, uh, organization. And the definition of that is that the API or the web API return a full data object as they are stored in the backend database. And the client app try to filter out some information and don't show this information to the normal user. Right? But the attacker call the API directly and get all the sensitive data that the UI would filter out. So this is the definition of uh, excessive data exposure. Exactly what happened to the uh, former farm business, right? And, uh, this is the definition, but in fact, there was no tool, at least to the best of our knowledge, that can effectively detect this problem automatically. And this is some uh, information that we got from uh, one company who worked on that topic and also from the OSAP itself. The key challenge is, is something we call the test oracle problem. How do we know if the web API return more enforced Listen, then they should. How do we know? Right? In, in the hacker uh, example, they need to inspect that, but how do we know the answer for this question automatically? This is something we call the test oracle problem. How do we distinguish between the expected behavior of the system and the unexpected behavior of the system? Right? So we have the solution. And for sure, manual detection doesn't work well because uh, suppose that we get like the uh, this and that's of uh, um, a few megabytes or whatever is uh, very challenging to manually look at this. So the current approach uh, supported by uh, many commercial tools is that they have some kind of like keyword matching. They have some keyword like bank account, passport number or whatever, and they try to uh, check if the text has those keywords. But in fact, sensitive information can be of many form. Maybe that approach works for the case of uh, uh, the former Prime Minister, but it doesn't work for many other places. So we need a better solution. And the key idea for us is that the key insight that we have is that data return from the API endpoint is more likely excessive it, if it has no impact on the content displayed to the user. Right? So basically what we have before, uh, if the content displayed to the user, if we delete the information like the passport information from the JSON uh, response, I doubt the uh, the page will be different. 
because they don't use that information at all, right? Even though the server respond that with all the sensitive information but from the client at the HTML, whatever we, I mean the user side, we don't see anything. So the key uh, assumption is that if a field is an, in an uh, JSON response, it's not needed. The render web page should not change if the field is deleted. So this is the key insight. So we just try to delete the data field one by one. And we observe the graphical user interface from the uh, front end to see if there's something different. If there's nothing different, that data that was deleted is considered like redundant or uh, essential data. So it's very simple, but uh, it's something a very uh, common concept in uh, software testing called like metamorphic testing. We don't know what is the way to detect any kind of like abnormal behavior system. So instead of finding something very concrete, we try to compare the uh, difference between the output when we already know some kind of like relationship between the input. In this case, the input the difference is only maybe a single data field, right? The original one and the one that we uh, deleted one single data field. And we check the output. If they are the same, that one is probably. And we implement everything in uh, a tool called EDFast. And this is the workflow. Uh, basically, it has uh, three steps. The first step, we try to save a copy of the render page. Basically, we uh, run the system at ease and we capture the normal uh, graphical user interface. And after that, we try to uh, delete uh, the response one by one. We send the request, but when we get the response, we mutate it, we delete uh, some data field, and we try to generate the DOM tree of the current uh, response. And we compare the DOM tree with the original DOM tree of the um, normal workflow. Right? And if they are the same, it's problematic. If they are different, it means that this data field is useful to some extent. But for sure, you can see that uh, in this case, there could be some kind of like potential false positive. Because uh, uh, of several reasons. One of the reasons is that when we uh, work on the web page, we know that we might not see any changes directly. But if we explore the web page a bit more, we might activate some JavaScript code, and those JavaScript code might use the deleted data field. And at that time, we know there's some difference. But it means that we need to explore it, and this is the reason why we still need the human at the end to confirm the finding. But at least uh, we argue that it's much better than doing the inspection manually or using the keyword matching. Doing the uh, inspection manually takes a lot of time. Doing the uh, keyword matching could lead to a lot of false negative, it means that we miss many potential issues. Right? And the result is very uh, interesting. We uh, tested uh, several companies in Australia. Uh, I don't show the name of those companies here, but we uh, have identified several interesting cases uh, for popular website in uh, Australia. And we also tried to use the tool to test uh, the top 200 uh, website all over the world in the LSI ranking. And we find few more uh, issues there, but uh, the one in Australia has uh, several potential uh, excessive data. Whether it's sensitive or not, it depends on the logic, depends on the business of the company. i give you a concrete example. So even though we report something uh, as the correct redundant information, but maybe people say, no, it's not sensitive. We detect one thing from a, a giant retailer in uh, Australia to show uh, the information that when the customer check for the um, current stock, whether the product is available or not, uh, even though on the website they just show available or not, but in fact in the later they show the exit number. And they also show the location, the store, whatever, right? So we might think, oh, compared to the passport number, driver license number, it's not sensitive. But I argue that it's sensitive in the sense that if the competitor knows that information, they can do something. And they can change the logistic policy to uh, move more product uh, to some area or whatever. Or some third party company 
who know the API, they can access the API and collect all the data from all the retailer in Australia, and they can use some app and sell to uh, some of us, get a few dollars for each of us, and they get some uh, uh, benefit from that, and we don't know, right? So it's sensitive or not sensitive, it's uh, like in the gray area. But uh, this only be beside if we have some human who know about the business, the company. But we have them to detect the potential issue. And the next step for them is to apply the business logic and make the decision. Uh, I try to wrap up uh, a bit more quickly so we have more time for discussion. And the last part, uh, as I said, is very uh, interesting uh, research about human in the group project. We try to leverage uh, human knowledge to improve the uh, result of fuzzing or testing in zero. But there are uh, five more like interesting questions when we try to evolve human. First, how do humans and fuzzing tools communicate? Right? The fuzzing tool gets stuck, but how do the tool tell the human? And when the human know the problem, how do the human success the uh, guidance or give some kind of like uh, instruction to, to the tool? How do they communicate? The tool work on the program source code Human work on natural language. They need to communicate somehow, right? ChatGPT, yeah, good. <laughs> and when they should talk to each other, because if the tool asks the human too frequently, the human would ignore. Right? Because you may think, oh, the tool is not good. Why I need to spend a lot of time helping the tool when I can spend more time to uh, build the application and so on, right? So we need to minimize that. And what human can have, can we reuse the previous succession to fix uh, another issue and so on? And how do we leverage the human guidance to improve the performance of fuzzing? And lastly, uh, but not the least, I think, is how to improve the graphical user interface of the tool so the human can easily use the tool. Why? You see, this is the current user interface for some fuzzing tools, state of the art fuzzing tool. It's look interesting for hackers, right? But it looks terribly bad for normal developers. So we need to improve because with this kind of like graphical user interface, it's almost impossible for the normal developer to have the tool, right? My point here is not for the security researcher. We try to build some approach that the normal developer without any knowledge of the security can still have. They just need to provide information about the design, the uh, implementation of system other tests. They don't need to know about port overflow. They don't need to know about SQL injection. No. Right? So this graphical user interface is not suitable at all. So uh, among all this, I would like to uh, quickly talk about uh, the uh, third point, what human can have. So recently, we conduct a, a study uh, together with uh, our collaborator from uh, Google to analyze uh, what are the current uh, path blockers which is the one that prevents fuzzing from making progress. So for example, if you write a uh, C program, you have some if statement. You have something like if uh, x equal to 10, you do something, otherwise you do something, right? So x equal to 10 is the guarding condition. You must satisfy that in order to go to the true branch, and you must uh, not satisfy that to go to the another branch. So in the program and test, we could have several and more complicated if conditional statement like that, and many of them could prevent other from making progress. So we need to analyze all of these things to make sure that we have a better view of what are the current um, obstacles preventing the uh, fuzzing from making progress before we move to the next step, because we want to know what kind of issue human can have, right? So we conduct this one, and it's mainly manual, uh, and this is not automated, but it's very important. And we uh, design a workflow that can be applicable to different types of system. Uh, we conducted our experiment on uh, a set of three popular library, the deep PNG for uh, PNG image, the iGraph for processing uh, the graph data, and the open SSL critical cryptography library. And the size you can see ranging from 100 kilo uh, line of code to um, more than a million line of code and so on. And uh, we try to uh, analyze all of the 
location at which the father cannot make progress, the father gets stuck, cannot move to one uh, of the learning cell. Right? So we have identified several interesting things, uh, more detail. Hopefully, I can get the paper accepted and I can share with you later. It's under review, but when the paper is accepted, I can share uh, more information. But the detail here is that we have identified several uh, types of uh, blockers. Uh, could be due to the wrong uh, function argument, could be due to the missing function code. For example, we cannot reach some piece of the code without calling some function and so on. Or uh, we uh, miss some orders. So you can see the order uh, matter as well, right? like the step one code problem. If you call the sequence of function in the specific order, you might analyze some part of the code, you might reach some part of the code. But if you change the order a bit, it might reach another part of the code. Right? And many of them, uh, the issue is that we haven't tested on the cases, so we miss many uh, uh, corner cases. For example, uh, all the top fuzzing blockers in the DPNG are input independent. It means that even we try to test or fast the program for forever, technically, right? we cannot input the result. Because some uh, blocker is not dependent only on the input, like the sample input that we prepare. It also depends on what kind of like, code that we uh, process the library. So my like libpnc is a library for you to write the program to process the PNC image. And it's only provide you some API. Okay. And you need to use the API to build the application to read the PNG image, to render the PNG image, to uh, store the PNG image or whatever. But you need to come up with your use case. And the normal use case is not wide enough, you know, broad enough to cover many things. So for some specific use case, if you keep trying to test this forever, you cannot input the result. But if you try another use case, you can input the result and so on. So uh, hopefully uh, you uh, understand a bit uh, about the technical detail of uh, what I have uh, presented so far. But the key takeaway I would like to share here is that fuzzing is simple, but very effective uh, technique for uh, automatically detecting software properties. Second, there are several open challenges uh, in this topic, and both the uh, academia and also industry are working together to address them. And uh, I'm very keen to discuss uh, any kind of like collapse opportunity with the people here at uh, MIT. So this concludes my talk. And thanks everyone for attending and listening to my talk. So now it's time for Q&A. Thanks a lot, uh, for the excellent talk. And uh, I learned quite a lot through mm -hmm. your talk. Uh, so any questions from the audience online and offline? Uh, actually, uh, if I understand your question correctly, um, you are talking about whether we have the tool for the second book. Uh, uh, we, not specifically, but uh, the general way, is there any like the mature uh, uh, tools that you use for the for other testing, for example? We have uh, a bunch of uh, different tools available out there, the open source one. Including the second book because we found pattern for the book. So, uh, my student is working on like, uh, preparing uh, the book base very carefully before we release the book. But uh, that will be released as open source as well. And all other tools we have. But uh, for the human development for the second book, that part, as I explained, we cannot ignore that part. Because whether the data is sensitive or not, right, it depends on the business. Like the example that I talk about, the detail. Yeah. Information, right? And we don't want to make that uh, decision uh, automatically. But who knows? Maybe right? in the future, when we have enough data, people can build some machine learning model to automatically suggest 
something like, oh, this is slightly sensitive or whatever, but who knows? And it's open for future research. Um, it was just a question about the first part of your presentation when you were talking about using the cosmological uh, terms mm -hmm. of uh, bug hunting. Now, uh, bounty bug hunting has become quite a big business. Yep. And, uh, and, and I noticed that you had at the beginning sort of Google as one of your partners. Is that an area that they're potentially in? And with your uh, application on GitHub, are you find that people are using it for bug hunting? Uh, and are they giving you that sort of feedback of how it's being used yeah. from that perspective? Yeah. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, so the first part about what the hunting, um, uh, security researcher who do bug hunting, uh, they use Python a lot. They might use some open source tools, but normally they treat it a bit different subject because you know if every uh, developer or every bug hunter is the same tool, like it's very likely that they get some kind of duplicate bugs and they. Get nothing from uh, the company, right? So they might have my main subject. For the second part, in uh, my collaboration with Google, uh, Google has a huge platform and they provide pretty competent resource uh, for uh, testing the most critical open source open system, uh, sorry, not open system, but library. So every time the developer makes any changes to uh, their code base, uh, Google will trigger some views and they will run as automatically on that. And so far, they have supported uh, at least 400 uh, most popular open source projects like OpenSSL and so on. So our tool, when we develop, uh, will be integrated into that system. So hopefully, we can find more work. In case we can find work and other we can find as well, hopefully, we can find us. So this is how we do not, but we don't uh, use that for book hunting. Maybe someone will use it out of video. So the next question is uh, from uh, Nasri. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, my question is about your second, the second part of your talk, which was about detecting excessive data exposure. I was wondering if you check the sensitivity or if somehow you measure the sensitivity of the data that is exposed or not. Uh, I think it's a very good question. And I, as I explained before, so far we made the assumption that uh, it will be best for the um, developer or the business owner to make the decision whether the sensitive uh, the information that we report is sensitive or not. But in the future, when we uh, have more user of the tool and when we can collect more data, maybe someone can build some machine learning based approach to uh, success, uh, something like it's lightly sensitive or whatever, depending on the uh, context of the application. But we, for this uh, specific work, we leave this part uh, to be done uh, by some uh, human, right? We don't have any tool for that part yet. We just check if some information is redundant or excessive, but whether it's sensitive or not, it's not covered in uh, our work. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, my, I have one probably very simple question is like, why, why do we have those uh, excessive data on the website HTML code from the beginning? Because uh, of several reasons. Uh, OSAP uh, is aware of this specific uh, uh, boundaries for law, so they give a lot of guidance for the developer. For example, you should not rely on the front end developer to filter out, <laughs> but they still do. <laughs> they still, for example, uh, like in the worst case, they are lazy. They don't want to filter out anything at the server side. They just collect everything from the database, just send to the client. This is the most common one. And in the second uh, one, even though they try to filter out some information, but they might miss someone, uh, some information, or they might misunderstand the uh, implication of that information. They might think that is not sensitive in some sense, but in fact, it's sensitive in another sense. Right? So, so many reasons. The back end just say, OK, here's all the data. Yeah. So just use it. Yeah. Instead of saying, OK, you can only use A, B, and C, and I only give you A, B, and C, yeah, that yeah. takes too much effort. Yeah, yeah. So recently, um, if you know about the RAP uh, QL, it is uh, another kind of design for web uh, API. 
you might be able to do in a better way, in such a way that you can specify the type of data that you respond based on the request from uh, the client. But it still rely on the developer. They still need to make the correct decision. Otherwise, the hackers still find a way to collect enough data for them to buy the information and do something harmful. So uh, this is software like a static because let's say there's a flag somewhere in the software where let's say creator or the admin can turn on the flag and then the software will behave differently. Um, yeah, would you be able to detect that sort of? Uh, as I explained, our approach for the second work is considered as a black box approach. It means that we don't care about what is working going on inside the system. Maybe they change the setting or whatever, we don't care. We just uh, consider the system as a black box. We uh, send some requests, we dismiss some response, and we see whether something uh, redundant is done. Oh, what I mean is, okay, so when you test the software, you play the role of the customer sending requests. Yep. But then there's, uh, let's say, the admin who can actually turn the flag or change a live code somewhere to make a, a well functioning software into a, a malicious one. Yes. So in that case, is it? Probably doesn't apply. Uh, it's interesting. At least our uh, approach now uh, doesn't like uh, tackle that uh, specific thing. Yeah, but in terms of testing, uh, if I'm not wrong, your example is considered something we call like configuration fuzzing or yeah. configuration testing. Because the system might work in this specific configuration, but might not work well for another configuration. So you can see from very high level point of view, it's like we problem the suspect, right? We test the software, so normally we can consider that we test the normal input only, right? But now we need to test all the configuration as well. And it makes the suspect bigger and bigger. And it means that we need to come up with better algorithm to uh, optimize the, the search algorithm. Okay. Uh, you, uh, your testing system, you, you a couple of your presentations, you know, uh, spoke about researchers around the world. Is it a community? Uh, uh, oh, is it a community package that people contribute and there's that agreement to what they exchange, what they uh, Yeah. How does the community aspect sort of work? I think it's an interesting question. Uh, basically, now we just uh, somehow like know each other uh, organically. Do the research, do the discussion, and so on. And uh, all of the two uh, events that I presented uh, in the talk was like invitation to the event. So it means that the organizer uh, know who are the active researchers in that field and they invite the first to come and have a discussion. But there's no kind of official uh, so community. So, so, what's the process for updating the system and the community to get part this? Is there a sort of protocol that's followed or process? We don't have that uh, protocol yet, but we have some kind of like uh, Slack or uh, Discord channel for the yeah. whole community. And every time we have newspaper, we have open discussion. Every time we have questions from beginner or from anyone, we try to answer those questions. So that's very active. Uh, it's Discord channel for another person. So it's called something like awesome fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we have a perfect timing here at 5 p.m. So uh, let's thank uh, our uh, excellent speaker today, Dr. Park, again. Um, and hopefully um, we can still catch up with him uh, in other sessions um, uh, about and also uh, possible collaboration uh, yeah. opportunity as well with the, with the uh, people from uh, our school and also uh, the, the center here. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, and thanks, everyone. For